Roman Catholicism, of course, is a form of mental illness. But if you've been born again and saved out of it, you already know that. You don't need me to tell you. <laughs> if you get the person to step back and look at it logically, <laughs> how can you believe this? The average person of average intelligence could not really defend its doctrines or its history on the basis of scripture. But it's amazing how it's the culture, you know, it's just culturally ingrained in people. And Talmudic Judaism is no different. We always have to draw a distinction between culture and real faith in Jesus. So many churches are just based on culture. They're just a culture. Sadly, even evangelical churches, on paper, they, they believe the gospel, Southern Baptists and things like this, and you go to Bible belts like this American South or, or, or Northern Ireland or East Africa or, or Korea is the one for Asia. You know, there's a lot of churches and everything, and on paper the doctrines are there. But if you talk about personal faith and a personal relationship with Jesus, even though the doctrines are there, well, some of them are saved, but a lot of them just have a religion. It's just very nominal. You know, it's just part of, this. it's just cultural Christianity. In the last days, cultural Christianity is going to be absorbed into the Antichrist system. Cultural Christianity will be absorbed into the Antichrist system. It is only that fellowship of the Holy Spirit based on a personal saving faith and relationship that's going to spiritually endure and theologically endure. The rest is going to be swallowed up. Now, I've pointed this out a number of times, but it's appropriate given our subject today to reiterate it, and certainly for the recording. A generation ago, let's say 40 years ago, when the average born-again Christian spoke of things like Babylon, it was understood in, in, in Christian nomenclature among evangelicals, it was understood that there were evangelical Christians, born-again Christians, and nominal Christians, and that Babylon was false religion. And when you said Babylon, it was understood commonly among believers. You were talking about liberal Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, or one of the cults like the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Babylon was false religion, even false Christianity, and people knew that. People knew that. Today, we have the wholesale apostasy of major evangelical movements and denominations. It's continuing with the New Apostolic Reformation. It began with the ecumenical movement. You have open apostasy within what was formerly evangelicism. The doctrines of salvation and sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fede, the things that came out of the Reformation, that'll be there on paper. But in terms of actual faith and what people do and believe is completely different. I live in Great Britain most of the time, the Church of England has something called the 39 Articles. The 39 Articles. If you were to read the 39 Articles, you'd likely agree with it. You'd likely agree with almost every one of them. But, but the bishops of the Church of England don't agree with it. They do things that are directly contrary to it. It just means nothing. It's only there on paper. What you see happening in the world is reflected in the Church. When the church becomes cultural, it becomes, we got to be recording, so we have to shut off telephones, okay? The church gets the same as the world. For instance, and I'm not trying to editorialize politically, every time you get on an airplane, the Fourth Amendment is being violated. <laughs> okay. Every time you get on an airplane, the Fourth Amendment is being violated. I lived in a country where everybody has a gun, where you see people going down the street with guns, and I just don't mean nine millimeters or 45s, or I, I mean people going down the street with Uzi submachine guns and M16s. People eating hot dogs with M16s over the shoulder. Guns all over the place, a society saturated with guns. There's almost no gun crime. Anybody who 
tries to rob somebody with a gun, is going to have a life expectancy in about two and a half seconds. <laughs> if they're lucky. I speak, of course, of Israel. Switzerland is similar. You know, I live in Britain, but I spend a lot of time in Northern Ireland. And I was there during the Troubles a lot. I spent a lot of time there during the, the Civil War, basically, between the Catholics and Protestants, the Unionists and the Republicans. Guns are illegal in England. Guns are illegal in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. They have no guns. You, can't, you basically can't get a gun. You can join a hunting club where the shotguns are kept at the club under legally controlled conditions, and you've got to get all kinds of licenses and background checks even to join the club. But <coughs> nobody has a gun. No, it's, even the police don't have guns except for special units. Nobody, has a, nobody packs a piece. In Northern Ireland, every single day of the week, people were getting blown away with guns. Tit for tat, Catholics and Protestants murdering each other just because of what church they went to. People were getting shot dead every, every day of the week. Every day. I was there. I saw it. Every bang, bang, every day. They'd shoot people in front of their families and also every crazy. Guns were illegal. <laughs> you have very strict gun control in South Africa. The gun crime in South Africa is unbelievable. We have a branch there. You wouldn't believe the gun crime. We have the highest gun crime in Europe is in a country where there are no guns that are legal, Russia. Guns are illegal. It's the worst gun crime in Europe. Countries where there is total gun control, like Norway and Sweden, have had things like Columbine and Parkland. That they've also, in Germany, they've happened in these countries. In the United States, the cities with the strictest gun control laws, like Chicago, have the highest amount of gun crime. The worst school shooting in the United States was that Sandy Hook one in Connecticut. Of the 50 U.S. states in Puerto Rico, guess which state has the strictest state gun laws? You're never going to stop criminals and terrorists from getting guns by depriving honest citizens from the right to defend themselves. That's my view, but I think it's statistically borne out. Okay? The point is, the Second Amendment doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. These rules you have in these states where you have the most gun crime, ironically, <laughs> are unconstitutional, in essence. Okay? Now, I, I agree that, you know, somebody with a, a psychiatric medical history or a convict should not be allowed to get a firearm. I, I certainly agree with that. But, but, I mean, I've seen countries where there's no guns. <laughs> but there's plenty of gun crime. W worse than here. Wor I've seen Northern Ireland. Worse than here. Um... Man has fallen. You, you can't have these utopian ideas coming into reality in a fallen world, not until the millennial reign of Christ. Amen. When he rules with the rod of iron, are you going to have what, 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 we'll, what we all aspire to? You know, you want to see that happen. Preach the gospel. In the meantime, it's those, with those duck hunters and, and the bayous, well, I forget what they're called, Phil and his family or something, they, they come out with the gun in one hand and the Bible in the other. I mean. <laughs> now, if you disagree with me, that's all right. I'm simply saying the Constitution means nothing. Universities in California. I remember when the free speech movement began in the 1960s in Berkeley, California. I was of that generation. I was a bit young, but I was in the hippie generation. I got saved out of the Jesus movement when there was a move of God among the hippies that began here in California, but I got saved in New York. But anyway, I remember the Berkeley free speech movement. It was in California at the universities where anybody can say anything. You know, you have a right to free speech, even if it was politically unpopular. Okay. Well, now it's the opposite. Now the left is anti-free speech. You know, <laughs> 
As Winston Churchill warned, after World War II, he said, the future fascists are going to be the anti-fascists. <laughs> <coughs> we live in a world where tolerance is redefined as you must approve of something. I was always willing to tolerate mutually consenting adults to have the sexual orientation of their choice as long as it was mutually consenting adults and they didn't try to force it on anybody else. I didn't care what somebody did in their bedroom. I didn't care if they were homosexual or heterosexual. I don't care if they like kangaroos. I didn't care. It just didn't matter to me. It just, I just couldn't possibly care less. I took people as individuals irrespective of their sexual orientation the same as I took them as individuals irrespective of their race or ethnicity or whatever, you know. I just didn't just, it just didn't matter to me. I just didn't care. I cared about you as a person. Whatever else, that's up to you. Just don't put it on anybody else. That, that was, it no longer means that. Tolerance means you have to sanction it. And if you don't sanction it, you're a racist or a homophobe. Yeah. <laughs> Things that don't make sense. Well, that, that's what's happened to society. The Constitution means nothing anymore. Okay? Righteousness exalts a nation. The Protestant democracies, particularly in the English-speaking world, the United States and Great Britain, were the ones that made the mold for the other countries, were founded on biblical principles. Somebody with a fifth-grade education can read the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution and say, these are theistic documents. That democratic freedom is predicated on the presupposition of the God of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. Any, a, an uneducated person could arrive at that conclusion. You've got the Supreme Court justices, people who went to Harvard and Yale Law, say, no, it doesn't mean that. It's an evolving document. No, wait a minute. Congress... Congress makes the laws, and we have an amendment process if you're going to evolve the document. No, the, the judges is going to decree it. That's not constitutional. Well, the Constitution means nothing. But why is that happening? It's happening because the Bible no longer means anything. The church is called to be salt and light. If the standards of God's word are not being held sacrosanct and observed by people who profess to be Christians, even people who profess to be saved, regenerate, born-again Christians. If that is no longer sacrosanct, immovable, what do you expect from the society? Jesus never said that corrupt judges or crooked politicians or parasitic bureaucrats are salt and light. He never said they're salt and light. He said Christians are supposed to be salt and light. Now, if the church is not holding to the divine constitution, what do you expect from society? You know, they don't care. They don't mean nothing to them. It means nothing. Well, this just doesn't mean anything to us. Don't expect society to become anything more than an exercise in social entropy. <laughs> That's all it's going to be. It's going down because... The Judeo-Christian foundation is crumbling, and the fault is with what professes to be the church. This is the sad reality of the times in which we live, and Christians need to understand that. That is simply the way it is. You look at churches compromising on same-sex marriage, on divorce and remarriage. I've known Christians say, I'm going, to, I'm going to vote for him or for her. Yeah, but they're pro-abortion. They're killing babies that can survive in an incubator and go into a normal life, and you're killing them arbitrarily in the name of women's rights. And, and this person you're voting for is in favor of that. This is going to bring God's judgment the way it did under King Manasseh to Israel. It's going to bring the judgment of God. Yeah, but there are other issues like the environment and global warming. <laughs> I've had people in New York tell me that. And it's Christians in California who think the same way. I've had people tell me that in England. 
You're sitting next to your wife or your husband. They drive you crazy. Get used to it. What God has joined together, let no man put us under. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. Thus a man strengthens his friend's countenance. It's supposed to be friction in a marriage because marriage is the closest form of fellowship God ordained and he uses it to deal with our old natures. Amen. She drives me right up the wall. <laughs> I'm going to wash that man right out of my head. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> When the permanency of a marriage, when God is joined together, when that goes, <coughs> the society's going to dissipate. The society's going to dissipate. And that's what's happening. You know, Afro <coughs> Americans had a lot of believers, particularly in this American South, but they came up to the cities. They were Baptists, they were Pentecostals. A lot of them went into the holiness traditions and things like that. But they had strong Christian values. I'm old enough to remember Jim Crow, the segregation of the American South, what was called apartheid in South Africa and the American South. It was Jim Crow, the aftermath of the Civil War. I remember going with my parents on vacation to Florida, driving through the South, and it was a different world when you crossed the Mason-Dixon line. I remember billboards, this is Klan country, restaurants, white only. I remember that stuff. I remember what it was, uh, very ugly, and I couldn't even, I was a kid, I thought it was crazy. You know, we didn't do this in New York or New Jersey. But I thought it was all nuts. And my parents explaining to me how it went back to the Civil War, and it was all crazy. And anyway, I remember, I'm just about old enough to remember it. Um, in the late 1940s, you had Afro-American war veterans who fought in Normandy, the invasion and things like that. They were hung by the Klan. They were hung by the Klan after they fought for this country. I remember there was black guys coming back from Vietnam, told that they were fighting for democracy, and they wouldn't let them go to the university in Mississippi or Alabama. And <laughs> That's the freedom that they fought for. you. I remember this stuff. I remember how bad it was and how stupid it was. I remember the injustice and I remember the stupidity. Um, and again, a kid coming from New York, I mean, it just, <laughs> it made no sense. I couldn't understand any of it. But anyway, in the late 1940s, fewer than one out of 10 Afro-American children were born out of wedlock. Fewer than one out of 10. Scripturally based family values. Okay. The civil rights movement came from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was based on Christian ideas, the same as the abolitionist movement to get rid of slavery in the 19th century came from Christian values. The abolitionists in New England and things like this, they were biblically based in their opposition to slavery. Okay. Um, that was always the way it was. Now they tell black young people Christianity is a white man's religion, Islam is the religion of black liberation. I've been to Africa too many times. Go on the Slavery International website, Sudan, Niger, Mauritania, Chad. Black slaves in the 21st century Slaves owned by Arab Muslims. Today, see in Saudi Arabia, rich sheiks going to buy underage girls in poor African countries, Muslim countries, and they call it an employment contract. They don't call it slavery. They give $200 or something to the, to the family and take the kid and put him in a harem. This goes on. Yet I'm supposed to believe, Farrakhan, that this is a religion of black liberation. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Now, 
get this. Three out of four Afro-American children are born out of wedlock. If you take the Afro-Caribbeans out, the immigrant blacks, who still have a certain amount of Christian influence in their families, it goes to nearly 80%. Nearly 80% of black children. Now, statistically, this goes back to Moynihan, who was a Kennedy Democrat. He was a Democrat. He was warning in the 1960s when these trends began, if this continues, you're going to have a social time bomb. Among black Americans, they were going to be the permanent low man on the totem pole if this is not redressed. The statistical predisposition to these kids born out of wedlock and single-parent families to wind up in the criminal justice system and to drop out of high school goes through the ceiling. But you look at their leaders. You got people like Jesse Jackson, fathered a kid out of wedlock and took money given to the Rainbow Coalition to help urban blacks and pay the salubrious salary to the mother of his love child to keep her quiet. And, and he's still the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Reverend Al Sharpton. This is their leaders. This is the church. Man, when you go back to look at the founders of civil rights before Martin Luther King, you go back to people like Booker T. Washington and, and people like this uh, and, and, and Frederick Douglass, the people who actually founded educated blacks who founded the civil rights movement, George Washington Carver, the scientists, all of these guys were committed Christians. They were all saved. They were all saved Christians, all of them. And there was upward mobility. Slavery was abolished. There was civil rights. It was, you leave Jesus out of the equation, what's going to happen? Now, if you say things like I just said, simply pointing out statistical facts, you're a racist. You're... What about those kids? You've replaced a black husband and father with food stamps and a welfare check. This is exactly what happened in, in, in the Jim Crow South or in the slavery. The black male was simply breeding stock. Then you go put him back in chains. He, gets, he, he goes get some woman pregnant, then he goes back into the state pen. It's the same thing that's always happened. Take Jesus out of the equation. It all goes down the tubes. There's a big threat to the Latino population. A big threat. If it was not for the growth of evangelicism among Latinos, Latinos would be on the same path as black Americans, politically manipulated into godlessness. Righteousness exalts a nation. And then you've got over here, an hour and 15 minutes from here, is Hollywood. The culture of celebrity. When because of mass media, people look to film stars whose personal lives are screwed up. Multiple marriages, they're all uh, tranquilizers, they're all on Prozac and God knows what else. Dude. And these become the celebratory figures to whom people look. They get them to give political messages and all this kind of stuff. And that's who people look to for guidance and leadership. They look for thespians, actors. They look to entertainers whose personal lives are messed. They're alcoholics. They're strung out. They're everything. And that's who society looks to. They look to... to this is madness. This is absolute madness. Well, the mystery already worketh. The trend towards these things has always been around to replace Christ with Antichrist. Remember, Antichrist does not simply or mainly mean against. It means in place of. In the Greek text, you have the repeated use of a term, pseudo, Pseudo-prophetes, a false prophet. A false prophet is not somebody who simply prophesies falsely. He's somebody who imitates a true prophet. Pseudo-logan, a false word of God. It tries to imitate the real word of God. The Koran, the Book of Mormon, the Shack. And now we have Christian translations 
that are completely corrupted, things like the, the message and things like this, this is a pseudo-logon. They try to look like the real deal. This spirit has always been there. It's always been there. Christians have always identified it. In the Middle Ages, after the Renaissance, and even before the Renaissance, there were some believers, like the Waldensians and so forth, and the Lollards in England who followed John Wycliffe, they knew the papacy was Antichrist. They knew what was then the mainstream church was an Antichrist institution. Okay? It was, so you had the papacy, and you had these underground movements of true believers who were persecuted, like the Bohemian Brethren under John Hus and the, the, the low lords on John Wycliffe and things on the Waldensians and things like this, it was always clear. The true church is underground. The papacy is the main church. And that was it, you know. That's how it was. Um, with the Reformation, it changed. But now it's changing again. It's going back. It's going to be this religious monolith it's going to be interfaith. It's going to be ecumenical. It's going to absorb many people professing to be evangelicals. Right? And there's going to be this alternative church that are going to be seen as divisive and undesirable, not just by the social mainstream, but by the churches that have joined the club. That is what is going to happen. All of it is setting the stage for Antichrist. Now, just look at certain trends right now. The mystery of lawlessness already worketh, but it was being restrained. And it still is, to a degree, being restrained. Now, look at this. One of the really main theologians in the Reformed churches, the Calvinistic evangelical churches, was J.I. Packer. Is J.I. Packer. Dr. James Packer, Regents College, Vancouver major author. He endorsed Peter Creed's book, Ecumenical Jihad. We have to unite with Islam to morally redeem society. Chuck Colson, the late, endorsed it. You've got major evangelical leaders endorsing an antichrist agenda. You've got people like John Piper promoting Rick Warren and his peace plan. We have to unite with people who worship other gods, Hindus, Buddhists, whoever, in order to bring in global peace. And this is the Antichrist agenda. The Constitution is gone. <laughs> Our Constitution is gone. That's why the society is going to the wall. The Word of God just does not mean anything. Think of a pressure cooker about to explode. That is where we are at. We are a social and religious pressure cooker about to explode, okay? We are approaching a point where he who restrains will do so no longer. You understand? The time to prepare for the explosion is today, is now. The Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful people of God for what's coming. All the stuff you see happening in society, in the, in the political realm, that the Constitution is being ignored or <laughs> rewritten, reinterpreted in such a way as basically being rewritten, not with any democratic process, just by judges. This is only a reflection of what's happened to the church, you understand? The scripture is rewritten. Does this, this, this? Oh, Jesus prayed we would be one. I actually had people telling me that many times. Yeah, now read the high priestly prayer. He prefaces that, that the world may believe we be one as the world may believe. He prefaces it by saying, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. You cannot have the unity of the spirit based on error. The unity of the Spirit depends on the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, not of error. The notion that you compromise truth for unity, this is just a lie. 
It's a big, and it's an obvious lie. But the same as corrupt courts. The federal appellate courts or the Supreme Court reinterpret the Constitution as something evolving. What these people are doing is they're reinterpreting the Scripture as if it is evolving. That's what they're doing. One of them, who performed the same-sex wedding for his son and his son's husband, the guru of the emergent church, Malcolm McLaren, what he said was, we should declare a moratorium on debating same-sex marriage for five years. Not even discuss it. And then if there's no consensus in five years, we should sequester it and not discuss it for another five years. And then the church should decide. You know what he's saying? He's saying the church wrote the Bible. The church can rewrite it. It's the word of the church. It's not the word of God. It puts the backslidden apostate church in place of Christ. You understand? It's antichrist. It's antichrist. It's not controlled or led of the Holy Spirit. It's controlled and imbued with the spirit of Antichrist. Okay? We have to understand what happened in Thessalonica in the first century is a microcosm of what is happening in our time and what is going to happen in the future. The stage is being set. Let's see what's going to happen next. I'd love to go through this verse by verse in Greek, but it's a Sunday we can't. You'll have to take my word for a few things and then go check it out later. Look with me to 2 Thessalonians. Verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. The pressure cooker is heating up. It's shaking on the, st on the grill. Okay. Well, what do you do if that happened in the kitchen? You'd try to switch the thing off and get the kids out of the kitchen, wouldn't you? <laughs> but they're turning up the heat. <laughs> they're turning up the heat. and letting the children play hopscotch next to the stove. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. There will be an assassination of the Antichrist. It may very well be at that point he will counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus and he will, in de facto terms, become Satan incarnate. You understand? Not just a zombification of the man of lawlessness, but his spirit will be Satan. He'll be totally animated by Satan. That will be the satanic counterfeit of the incarnation of Christ. You understand? Only the Lord's going to get rid of this guy once and for all. Satan is the most powerful angel God ever created. So powerful that he thought he could usurp the place of God. Not by any human means is he going to be gotten rid of. It's only the Lord who can get rid of him. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all powers and signs and false wonders. Now, we've talked about this a lot. Remember, Jesus said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. I am not in any sense a cessationist. I believe in the same if the old signs and wonders, but not false ones. So much of what we see today, particularly those associated with the money preachers, are nothing other than false. A wicked generation seeks a sign. One of the key ways the Antichrist and false prophet are going to deceive not only the public at large, but deceive people who profess to be believers is with signs and wonders. Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron. 
That does not mean that what they did was not supernatural. It was. But they did it by demonic power. It was not leger d'homme. It was really by demonic power that they did it. Now, the miracles of Moses and Aaron were stronger. Their snake ate the other snakes. But they can still do things. I have seen people who practice witchcraft who, who could do supernatural things. It, I've seen this with witch doctors and things in the third world. I've seen things in Indonesia and Africa and stuff, and I've certainly even seen certain things in the United States and England where with the demonic power, people could do the supernatural, things that could not be explained scientifically or rationally. Um, but they're nothing like what this guy's going to do. They're nothing. You get a guy like Uri Geller, well, he's basically a con artist. He, he's, he's, he's been exposed and debunked. What he, he, you know, he was a pretty good, <laughs> he was a pretty good illusionist. But that's all he was, was an illusionist. I'm talking about people who can do stuff that are not an illusion. I mean, I've watched people demon-possessed in, in, in an island in Indonesia. They were eating glass, chewing it right in front of me. And their gums wouldn't bleed, and they were eating it like it was biscuits and stuff. I mean, stuff that you could, medically couldn't explain it. That they, they did it. I watched them do it. All kinds of things. But let's go further now. Be careful of the signs and wonders thing. Remember, biblically, these signs follow. Jesus never allowed signs and wonders to be the focus of his message or his ministry. When you see people who do, they are not of God. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now, we have to understand this, we have to understand what it means by sozo, saved. Again, salvation is past, present, and future. When we were saved, we were justified. We are being saved. We are being sanctified. We shall be saved. We shall be redeemed. He picks up his parcel. Okay. It is a mistake to limit the intended objects of this verse those who perish because they did not receive the knowledge of truth so as to be saved. It is a mistake to limit the object, the, those who are not going to be saved, to people who are not believers. Okay? The foolish virgins are going nowhere. We've been saved. We're being saved. We shall be saved. There will be an apostasy. There will be a falling away. The apostasy is not the rapture. Now it gets really heavy. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, you have a prophecy about Judas, which mirrors a prophecy of the Antichrist, where he is called God's agent. We deal with it in the book, Shadows of the Beast. Now look at verse 11. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence, so they will believe what is false in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. When people reject the doctrinal truth of God's word, they are in some way taking pleasure in wickedness. When somebody goes off morally, they will go off doctrinally. Remember, Jude's epistle tells us there are as many backsliders inside the church as there are who have left it. The blemishes on our love feasts. He describes what they're like. Okay. The church of Sardis is like this in Revelation chapter 3. Okay. This is quite a situation. You've got these people. And they're rejecting the truth of God's word. Just like the judges that reject the Constitution. 
They reject what God's word says. Because they're taking pleasure in wickedness. They may be religious. There are people who are involved in the grossest situations who go to church on Sunday. Um, you got people who are divorced and remarried for no biblical reason. And they're trying to justify it scripturally, even though you can't justify it scripturally. They're taking pleasure in wickedness, you understand? They're taking pleasure in wickedness. Every time you sleep with them, every time you sleep with them, you're taking pleasure in wickedness. It does not have God's blessing. You're taking pleasure in wickedness. When someone goes off morally, they will go off doctrinally trying to justify it. When somebody goes off doctrinally, it is often, if not usually, a symptom that they've gone off morally. You see these guys, again, I'm not throwing mud or it's not gossip, it's publicly known. <coughs> Look at Bob Coy, <coughs> pastor of the biggest evangelical church in the United States, probably, certainly the largest Calvary chapel. When my mother lived in Florida, I would visit her and I would attend that church. There was traffic jams on I-95 on the interstate every Sunday, people trying to get to that church. The police were out there with the lights on trying to direct traffic. The guy began right. The guy began teaching the same way and the same things Chuck Smith did. And God added to his numbers and God was blessing it and using it and all oh, those thousands of people and it was obviously something that God began. But then his doctor got more and more seeker friendly and seeker sensitive and more and more into the entertainment and more and began going and going. And then pop. The guy was immoral. Um seriously immoral. You know, if if you go out and fool around with women or a hooker or something, that's completely wrong. But when you use your position as a pastor to become sexually predatory, that's much worse. You understand? It's much, much worse. It's much worse. Uh, his doctrine went off. I was not a bit surprised when his morals went off, now they find out that the guy was messing around with a four-year-old or something. You know, he, he lost his secular job because he had a history of, the, they say it's on the internet and the news, it was in the newspapers in Florida, of a, of a four-year, what kind of a sicko? This was the pastor of the beast. Now pay attention. Oh no, not him. Oh no, not Jimmy Swaggart. I might have believed it about Jim Baker, but not, not, but not, 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 not Jimmy Swaggart. Yeah. The Antichrist is going to bamboozle the church. Nobody would ever, ever suspect him. Now, in the book Shadows of the Beast, we deal with this, how he's the son of perdition like Judas. The Holy Spirit is always trying to show us about the Antichrist through Judas. When you see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is trying to show you something about the Antichrist. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? They had no idea. They had no idea who this guy was. Some people, it's obvious they're going off and they're flaky. Some of them were always off the wall. But this guy, <laughs> he's going to be good. He's going to be real good. There's a lot more to be said about this. I'm only dealing with it to the extent it affects the text of Thessalonians. The Lord will send the delusion. Turn with me, please, to 1 Kings Chapter 22, verse 13. 
Then the messengers who went to summon Micaiah. Micaiah is almost the same as Michael. Michael, Micaiah is he was like unto God. Micaiah is he who was like unto Yahweh. Spoke to him saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, I will speak. Now here's the thing. Just as with Jeremiah in the court of Zedekiah, the people who persecuted Jeremiah, they knew he was the true prophet. <laughs> they knew the other ones were false. But it was about power and money. They loved the world. Verse 15, when he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramat Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered, go up and succeed and the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. He says what, what the false prophets say. Then the Lord said to him, how many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? You don't tell me things I want to hear. You tell me things that are the truth. I know you're lying. <laughs> So he said in verse 17, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep, which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel and Je <coughs> said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? And Micaiah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the hosts of heaven, Tzavaot HaShemaim, standing by him on his right hand and left, and the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramat Gilead? And one said this, and another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? And he said, I'll go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, you are to entice him and to prevail. Go and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. I will make you believe the lie. Since you reject the truth, since you want to believe a lie, I will not only allow you to believe the lie, I will cause you to believe the lie. That is what is going to happen. To a degree, it has begun already. Well, what is the lie? It's the lie of the Antichrist, isn't it? The man of perdition. Look at Revelation chapter 6. Verse 2, I looked and behold the white horse. The voice said, come from the thunder. And he who rode upon it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. That's the white horse. It's evil, it's bad, but it's on a white horse. Why? Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 19. Verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. Do you see how the Antichrist counterfeits Christ? He comes before him, trying to look like him. Trying to parody what he's going to do. If you believe the false, if you reject the true Christ, you're going to believe the false one. 
and he's going to be very convincing. But you won't take much convincing because God's given you over to this. Not you, but those people. This is what is known as a spirit of error to the exponential degree. The spirit of error. It's not just that they're in error, but God gives them over to it. Now we have a teaching on the spirit of error. We, we explain it. It comes from 1 John. But you see an example of it in Romans 1. Speaking of homosexuals and lesbians, it says three times, the Lord gave them over to it. They think it's natural. They think that it's normal to do something and be something contrary to nature, but it becomes their nature. They just don't see it as unnatural, even though common sense indicates it is unnatural, even though biological science shows it is unnatural. It becomes natural to them. They think it's normal and natural to be that way. They reach a point where they are given over to it. Now, we talk about this also on our teaching on not even a minyan, on Sodom and Gomorrah, where the homosexuals were so driven, so driven by an, an unnatural lust, an, un, an unnatural lust. If God forbid one of us should lose our eyesight suddenly, we'd say, get us to an ophthalmologist, get us to a hospital. These guys were so driven by an unnatural passion to gang rape the two angels manifested as men that they were still trying to force their way in after they lost their eyesight. You'd think any more, I've lost my eyesight, kid. That is how powerful that spirit is. That spirit in the back of homosexuality, that is how powerful it, it takes total possession. To the point nothing else matters, but that, but that unnatural passion, it can go that far. People are given over to it in Romans. But that's only one example. That's only one example. People who reject the truth of God's word have rejected the true Christ. He is the word made flesh. They are going to be consumed, given over by a spirit. Now, I have seen, you have seen, manifestations of it, hints of it, or, or, or little seepages the pressure cooker is building up, right? And when it's building up, maybe the lid is, is by thermal pressure, ex expanded and pushed open, and a little bit of water comes out onto the stove. Just a couple of drops, bubbles, and okay, but before it blows up, okay, in response to the thermal pressure. Okay. Well, I saw this in Toronto, Canada, and in Pensacola, Florida people manifesting things that were not only carnal, but some of it demonic, saying it was the Lord, it was the Holy Spirit, that it was right. They were totally given over to something. When you show them the scripture, the fruit of the Spirit is a crete self-control, and it's in there twice, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's an evolving document. <laughs> God is doing a new thing that's not scriptural. God's greater than his word. This is what they were saying. They are given over to it. These counterfeit revivals in Pensacola and Toronto and things, I didn't understand it initially. But they were not simply deceptions. They were judgments. You understand? They were judgments. They're just little drops escaping from inside the pressure cooker coming down onto the stove and being vaporized immediately. But they're a hint of what's inside and what's to come when the explosion happens. Okay? That's what's going on now. That is exactly where we are at. Okay? We don't know the day or the hour is coming, but we know the signs. Okay? If you had asked me 25 years ago why I believed it was the last days, I would have talked a lot about the Middle East and the countries at the center of world events today are the same ones at the center of world events in scripture and so forth. 
I still believe that even more now than I did then, and I believed it then. I don't, th I, I don't in any way believe that less. But the clearest sign, the single clearest sign that the Lord is coming is the Antichrist is getting ready to come before him, and this involves the deception in the church. People who used to be stalwarts, people who you thought they were right, and you can always, well, he's always going to be there. You know. Something happened. We have a tape where we talk about this. God takes the righteous voices away. Remember Samuel was gone and Saul was given over to it and he turned to the occult and to the necromancy and witchcraft and things like that at Endor because Samuel was gone, you know. The righteous man perishes and no one takes it to heart. This happened in Great Britain. After Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and after the scholar F.F. F. Bruce and them and Campbell Morgan, there was a vacuum. There were no longer... The tradition of great British preachers and expositors that went back to Charles Spurgeon and things, there was nobody like that anymore. There was just a vacuum filled by theocrats and opportunists and hucksters, you understand? And at that time, I'm talking maybe 20 years ago now, or 15 years ago, I said to the United States, what's going to happen when Dave Hunt is not here and David Wilkerson is not here and Chuck Smith is not here? I said that 15, 20 years ago. Well, Chuck Smith is not here. David Wilkerson is not here. You know what I mean? Dave Hunt is not here. Until now it's happening in America. It's the same thing. God removes prophetic warning. You know, Micaiah didn't even want to tell him, yeah, you're going to want to go ahead. He didn't want to talk to him. <laughs> he... he he had to wring it out of him. <laughs> Jeremiah, go ahead, don't you finish. What's the difference? That's where we're at. What I'm concerned with now is building up the people who are going to be in the remnant, the faithful church. I'm looking for the, you know, I'm looking to feed the 7,000 who don't bow the knee to Baal. I'm looking for the sons of the prophets. You know, I'm, <laughs> The rest of them are singing hill songs. Forget about it. <laughs> There's a lying spirit in the mouth of their prophets. God is causing them to believe this. When the Antichrist comes, the man of lawlessness comes, he will be a judgment of God on unbelief. But that unbelief will include the apostate church. And it happens so quickly. Let's look at Costa Mesa, Calvary Chapel. They're openly, openly, publicly, and on the radio denouncing the teachings of Chuck Smith. <laughs> Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa is not in the Calvary Chapel Association anymore. In other words, it used to be a Calvary Chapel by being affiliated to Costa Mesa. That was the flagship. Well, the flagship is no longer in the fleet. <laughs> Calvary Chapel is no longer Calvary Chapel. It's, <laughs> it's a fleet without a flagship. When Chuck, when Chuck Smith was buried, they should have buried Calvary Chapel with them, you know. <laughs> it's just what happens. It's what happens. After the last apostle went, John, at the end of the first century, the Gnostics moved in big time. There were some people who God used to preserve the truth and explain what was happening, like Irenaeus. But once the apostles were gone, they moved in big time. Well, it's happening now. It, you know, you always had guys who stood up and told the truth, and it kept the error at bay somewhat. They're gone now. Most of them are gone. Adrian Rogers is with the Lord. David Wilkerson's with the Lord. Dave Hunt's with the Lord. 
Chuck Smith with the Lord. There's, there's no standard. Not anymore. We might get people like Irenaeus who can explain the error, but we don't have any bulwarks anymore. That, 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 that's, that's largely gone. It's, it's villains. As, as Spurgeon prophesied over 100 years ago, Charles Spurgeon prophesied, a time is going to come when instead of having sh shepherds in the pulpits feeding the sheep, we're going to have clowns entertaining the goats. In the pulpits, instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, you're going to have clowns entertaining the goats. And that's what you've got. Spurgeon's prophecy was exactly right. People who used to be right, people like John MacArthur saying the most outrageous things, that it will be possible to sell your soul to the devil, take the mark of the beast, worship the Antichrist in his image, and still be born again and get saved. This is MacArthur. He's gone. He's just another one. He's just gone. It's all gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Now, this is what Thessalonians said was going to happen. You understand? God is giving them over. You see all this stuff with the new apostolic reformation, these things gaining momentum, the way the ecumenical movement gained momentum. It's God giving them over. You understand? It's not just the devil deceiving them. That's how it began. It's the judgment of God. Now, if you say this, don't expect anybody to believe you. There's not much capital in truth. There's no, you know, no. The people didn't like Micaiah, but he's the one who told the truth. The people didn't like Jeremiah, but he's the one who told the truth. The people didn't like Amos, but he's the one who told the truth. If you tell the truth, they're not going to like you. <laughs> you, you got to accept that for the reality it is. Now, believe me, it brings my heart no blessing to say these things. I wish I was wrong. I profoundly wish I was wrong. I would love to be wrong. But I know I'm not. I know I'm not. And I, <laughs> and I never wanted to be somebody who said these things. You know, I'd, 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 I'd rail against the Jehovah's Witnesses or something, but I don't want to be saying these things about the church. <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. Think of yourself as a Thessalonian. You're being told ahead of time what's coming, and you're being given the understanding and the wisdom by God's Spirit to know what's happening and why, okay? Well, let's continue. He'll send upon them a deluding influence. Verse 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification, by the Spirit, and by and faith in the truth. I thank God that there are still people like you. I thank God that there are brethren, brothers and sisters like you. God has elected you, chosen you, from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification, by the Holy Spirit, and faith in the truth. You know the truth. That is God's grace. You understand? I thank God that there's some people who don't get on the bandwagon. Or if they do, it's only to warn the other ones and then they jump off. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, there's glory ahead. Always remember. 
it can be pretty miserable at times, but I read the end of the book. And in the end, because of Jesus, we win. He can't lose. If we stay in him, we can't lose. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught. Hang on to the truth that God has allowed you to understand. That you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now, I'm not putting myself in the category of people like Paul by any means. I'm only reteaching what he taught. You understand? He was an apostle who had the Holy Spirit. I'm just, I'm just representing in a modern setting what he taught. <laughs> okay, he was an apostle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who's loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Despite the times in which we live, despite the pressure cooker getting ready to explode, we still have something we need to say and we still have things we need to do. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. But right now, we have to capitalize on whatever opportunities the Lord allows us to have. It's not enough to know this stuff. It's not enough to understand what's going on. It's not enough, as Jesus said, to interpret the seasons correctly. If you understand what he meant by interpreting the seasons, he was going back to the Song of Solomon, which was read liturgically in the synagogues and in the temple that week when he said it. And the betrothal, the engagement, as it were, would take place in the springtime around Passover. And the bride, he'd go prepare a place for her, and she'd know he's coming back. She wouldn't know the day or the hour, but she knew it was getting closer by watching the seasons. It was the winter, you know, and, 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 and then the Song of Solomon, the winter's passed, and then the flowers begin to come, and the migration patterns of the birds begin to show up with the butterflies, and the, and the fauna and things like this, and she's watching the seasons. It's the seasons that are telling her that he's coming again. Well, that we're watching the seasons. We don't know the day or the hour, but we're watching the seasons. The other ones are, a, the, the faithful bride watches the weather. She's a weather fanatic. She's a weather freak. She, she watches the weather channel every day. She looks out the window. heavens. <laughs> She's obsessed with the weather. <laughs> the faithful bride is obsessed with the weather. Okay. <laughs> and how it affects the, the wildlife and the grass and the flowers and the trees and things like this. She's totally infatuated watching it because it's the only timepiece she has. Okay. Well, that's how we look at prophecy, the seasons. You understand what I'm saying? That's why Jesus was drawing on the imagery of the Song of Solomon. That's what they were reading that week. Okay. Well, let's look now. It's almost like where we put the chapter division seems to be the end of the epistle. But of course, there's no chapter division in the original canon. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you and that we will be rescued from the perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. Notice the emphasis on seeing the gospel, the true gospel, prosper. Seeing as many people get saved as possible, and obviously discipled, but also looking to be rescued. <laughs> Daniel first speaks of the rescue, chapter 12. But in his first Epistle to the Thessalonians, as we looked at yesterday, Paul speaks of the rescue. The rapture is something very real. And when it happens, it will be a rescue from perverse and evil men. Not all have faith. Now, he's not talking simply about the pagans. He's talking about people who profess to know the truth. Certainly at his time, it would have been his fellow Jews who rejected Jesus, 
persecuting his fellow Jews who did believe in him. They, not, they didn't have the real faith. They had the religion. You understand? Well, it's the same with Christianity. They don't all have the faith. They just have the religion. There's a big difference between Christianity and Christendom, between the culture and the relationship. They all have the religion, but they don't have the faith. Now, he's saying this way back then. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command, that is the apostolic commandment. Let me tell you something. I have no confidence in you, and you should have no confidence whatsoever in me. But I have a confidence in the Lord and what he's doing in you. <laughs> Apart from that, we'd be just as crazy as the rest of them. In my case, more so. <laughs> May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. You know, these days... We're either going to get closer to Jesus or further from him. You cannot remain static in the present environment. You cannot remain static. You're either going to get, we're either going to get closer to him or further or drift, but you cannot remain static. That's a general truth, but in the last days it becomes what we call kalvahoma. It becomes an amplified truth. Okay. We command you, brethren, now he's speaking by the Holy Spirit. It's thus saith the Lord. He's using apostolic authority. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is not Paul giving the command. It's Jesus giving the command through an inspired apostle that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the traditions which you receive from us. He doesn't say these people were never saved. He doesn't say these people were never saved. You see them living unruly lives. Again, the, perhaps the biggest, the most prolific example of it is the sickening level of divorce and remarriage among believers. They're not under the rule of Christ. They take the Lord's Supper, they defile his table and eat and drink judgment to themselves. Now, that's probably the most prolific example of an unruly life, but it's not the only one. I don't understand. A new believer, you can cut him some slack because we all know what it's like to be a new believer. But how... Bad company corrupts good morals. You can have social acquaintances from work or neighbors with unsaved people. You can have acquaintances, and it can be friendly. But real friendship is the thing of fellowship. There's only one exception in Scripture, where a believer can have a close relationship with a non-believer. That is, if you are already married, and then you get saved, and your husband and wife is unsaved, there is a special provision in 1 Corinthians 7. But you, you, you can't have friends who are not, you can have acquaintances who are not believers. Christians need to be careful even of having business or professional associates who are not believers. It's not guaranteeing a Christian is going to be what a Christian should be all the time, but even becoming legally or financially associated with the secular world. I have to have my legs doppled tomorrow, my lower limbs, because I have lymphatic edema. That's why I'm so plump. And I'm going to see my friends tomorrow. He and his wife are both doctors. They treat me at the Christian brother rate, and they're going, to, they're going to see if I have any thrombosis, any embolisms tomorrow. I'd much rather go to Christian physicians than unsaved ones. And my friend and his wife, Gabby and Christina, are going, yeah, amen, brother. Praise the Lord, sister. 
<laughs> I'm good with that. Now, if I had to go to an unsafe physician or lawyer or something like that, I would do it. But I want my relationships to be with other people who believe what I believe. To socialize and hang out with unsafe people. That's just looking for trouble. Now, you can associate with them in terms of you trying to witness to them and, and bring them to Bible studies or think, home groups and things like that, and you work with people and things like that and be a testimony to them. But to hang out with unsafe, hang out with them? If I hang out with unsaved people, I have an evangelistic goal. <laughs> I'm thinking about finding a way within that relationship to share the gospel with them. I, I had a, a Jewish friend named George. I paid, prayed for him for over 30 years. And I would still hang out with him when I, when I, I lived in Israel and England, whatever. I, when I went to New York, I'd see him, I'd talk to him, we, whatever. Hang out a bit, you know. He was my friend before I was a Christian. We were on drugs together. But I know why I was doing it. He knew I wouldn't come on in and roll the joint, get some coke. I didn't do that anymore. He did it, but I didn't. He saw there was a difference in me. And I, yeah, I still associated with him, but it took over 30 years, but he became a believer in Jesus. <laughs> he says it became obvious Jesus is the Messiah. I remember he told me, you know, stuff you said 20 years ago was going to happen, prophetically. It's, it's all happened. You were right. The prophecy was one of the things that got him going on it. Yeah. Okay, you can do that. You can have unsaved acquaintances with an evangelistic goal, but don't hang out with unsaved people. You can't social. They're on their way to hell. Either you're going to be God's agent to draw them to life, or they're going to be Satan's agent to draw you to death. The only exception is if you're stuck in a marriage to a non-believer. And even then, the goal has to be for them to become a believer. Let's look at this now. For you, you see, when I see Christians hanging out with unsaved people, they're living an unruly life. You yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you, nor because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. One of the advantages to having the grace to be single is you don't have a family to support. It was easier for Paul to work part-time making tents and not have to take. I've said many times, watch out for sordid gain. Be careful of people who see the ministry as a career, as a job, instead of as a calling. If you're not willing to do it without any financial remuneration, don't do it. If God calls you into full-time ministry, he will provide, and that is noble, and that is honorable. But be careful of people who go into the ministry looking for a livelihood. I thank God I made tents for years. I filled prescriptions six days a week, six, <laughs> or five and a half days a week, and, and did the ministry in addition, called at a congregation and things like this. It's easy to tell people how to be spiritual when you get paid for being spiritual. <laughs> But you've got to go out and earn a living and live in the same world they do. Then you have a right to tell. Now, this is no way to deter people from being in full-time ministry if God calls them to it. <laughs> Marco broke his neck working in logistics management, supporting his family and pastoring a church at the same time. Okay. The church grew, the ministry grew, Moriel grew, he needed to go full-time, and so he switched from secular job to full-time. That's perfectly scriptural and perfectly honorable. It's perfectly right. But it has to be that way. But it has to be that way. <laughs> it has to be that way. The ministry developed and he grew into that situation. Me too. Okay. Most of the people in Moriel are volunteers. It's our missionaries in other countries that are full-time and things. That's, it has to be that way. Most of us are tent makers. Even I have part-time business. You know, 
It's the way it is. Be careful of people who are not like Paul when the ministry becomes a career. Now, what happens? Once it becomes a career, they get credentialed with a denomination. They get an accommodation allowance, a parsonage, a house to live in. Okay. Their financial stipend, their pension, their superannuation, their medical insurance, which is expensive in this country, all of these things are contingent upon their ordination in the denomination. <laughs> and so they become financially pressured, induced by financial practicality into conforming to an agenda that may not be right. This is one of the reasons we should have autonomy, scripturally, this is autonomy of a local congregation. Separate issue. But this is what happens. There is a big, big danger when somebody turns the ministry into a career instead of a calling. If you're not willing to walk out the door and resign from the denomination, you're not working for Christ. You're working for a religion. <laughs> well, let's look. For even when we were with you in verse 10, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. It is not an honorable thing to live off of food stamps and welfare. Now, I'm not talking about disability benefits. I'm not talking about short-term unemployment if somebody is, remains redundant. But I have known cases of Christians, Christians, who survived off public benefit. That is not right. I've even known cases of Christians who survived off public benefits so thinking they could serve the Lord. <laughs> no, that's a bad witness and a bad testimony. Pray for a job, he'll give you one. Might not be, I hated my job, but it was the only thing I was qualified to do, fill prescriptions, so I did it. It was 5% medicine and pharmacology, 95% filling out forms. I despised it. <laughs> it was boring. And it was in a Hasidic Jewish neighborhood. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're all, they all bought eye drops from reading the, the Talmud. <laughs> They have to have a baby every year because one of them might be the Messiah. <laughs> I could have dealt birth, birth control pills under the counter and turned it into a racket. <laughs> I hated it. But I had a family to support. It was the only thing I knew about. Well, let's look. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. Don't grow weary. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person. Do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. There is a distinction between guilt by association and guilt by cooperation. Pay attention. When is with unsaved people? Jesus was accosted by the religious hypocrites because he ate and drank with tax gatherers and prostitutes and things like this. If you don't associate with unsaved people, you cannot witness to them. He said the physician came for the sick, not the healthy. Okay. There is no guilt by association in dealing with unsaved people for the purpose of reaching them. But when you associate with somebody who professes to be a believer who is into heresy or immorality, we are told in 1 Corinthians 5 also, a so-called brother who is a swindler. Jim Baker is a swindler. 
He's selling, now he's selling survival water for $150 a bottle, you know? <laughs> because the tribulation is coming. The guy's a swindler. He's always been a swindler. We shouldn't associate with people like that. I tried to tell Jonathan Kahn, why are you going on his TV show? He's a so-called brother. He's a brother. No, he's not. He's a so-called brother, Paul says. He's a swindler. Association is cooperation. Not with the unsaved, but with those who profess to be saved. But now we have to be careful. Let's look at this. They should be publicly humiliated if they go into this. You know, how can you talk that way about Jim Baker? He should be publicly humiliated because he's discrediting the church. Yet, in verse 15, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I don't like you, but if you really were born again and you are my brother, You've got to stop doing this stuff. But if you don't stop doing this stuff, I'm not going to associate with you. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. Notice peace is not the absence of conflict. It's peace in the conflict. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have peace. This is the Greek word for peace, Irene, get the girl's name Irene, means an absence of conflict. The Hebrew word shalom does not mean that. I've said this a number of times on the internet and so forth. Does anybody want me to explain what shalom means? Does anybody doesn't know? Okay. Shalom comes from the infinitive of the Hebrew leshalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. Shalom le shalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. We have shalom because Jesus came to pay the price for our sin, to fulfill the law, the Torah, and to fill us with his spirit. Ultimately, shalom will include the absence of conflict. As Isaiah wrote and prophesied, the nations shall beat their Swords into pruning hooks, and neither shall they learn war any more. Lo isa goy lo goy herev lo yilmadu od mil hama. And the black Americans, they they made a really good gospel song of it. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. No more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Gonna lay down my sword and shield down by that riverside, down by the riverside, down by that riverside. Lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, down by the riverside. Isaiah would have sang it a little bit different. Louisa <laughs> Goy, La Goy, Hedeth. Two different cultures, two different languages singing the same thing, but the same truth. Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful? The oneness of the Spirit. May the Lord Himself, the Lord of Peace, you can be in the biggest conflict, and a conflict is here, and a conflict is coming. Have peace in it. Himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance, even in conflict, we can have His shalom. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write, because there were people who were 
basically they were sending counterfeit letters and they were uh, forging his signature. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. <coughs> well, <coughs> Paul said that <coughs> by the Spirit to the Thessalonians. <coughs> and that same Holy Spirit is saying that same thing to us today. We will have peace in every circumstance. Yeah, I know this stuff is happening, and I know the pressure cooker is going to explode. But I thank God for the people like you who know the truth. Hang on. Hang in there. The Lord is indeed coming. God bless.